this video is about Doris Castle Ross, now known today as the great aunt of models and actresses Cara Delevingne and Poppy Delevingne. Doris was born to a man who owned a haberdashery shop and he also dealt in French luxury goods while her mother was a housewife. Doris's mother flew the nest in the wake of the First World War and started working as a pantry maid at an RAF hospital in Hampstead before ret returning to London where she sold second-hand gowns to actresses. In this way, Doris, the eldest daughter of the pair, became acquainted with the London theater scene. She entered the family business as a saleswoman of second-hand dresses serving theaters in London, and as a result, met the actress Gertrude Lawrence, who introduced her into London society. She hadn't been um, completely unknown to London lovers beforehand, though. In this way, she was socializing with actresses and people connected to the theater scene, such as writers and journalists, and she became really good friends with Gertrude Lawrence. And so Gertrude was the mistress of household cavalry officer Philip Astley. And they invited Doris to come live with them in the Mayfair flat that Philip Astley was paying for. Gertrude had a pretty um, topsy-turvy life herself. She engaged in an affair with Gerald du Maurier, the father of Daphne du Maurier, and their affair impacted writer Daphne for years afterwards. So Gertrude and Doris uh, hit the town often. They dined at rules, they dined at nightclubs, they mixed with the Prince of Wales, who got in trouble with his father, King George V, for attending one of Doris's Mayfair parties. She and her friends were regulars at the Cavendish Hotel and they struck a friendship with Rosa Lewis, who was the, a very famous chef and considered to be the UK's first celebrity chef. And she was also Edward VII's mistress. Doris worked as a chorus girl and hostess at the Grafton Galleries a nightclub in the basement of a Mayfair Impressionist art gallery. While working as a chorus girl and hostess, Doris earned the nickname the girl with the white gloves due to the white opera gloves she wore. Part of Doris's appeal was she was a very well-dressed woman. Her prior career in haberdashery served her very well. And in many photos of her, you can see her wonderful attire. Part of what drove her to her mistress lifestyle was the love of beautiful things. Supposedly, she never wore the same pair of French silk stockings twice. She also insisted on having French and Italian made shoes. Often when she went to buy shoes, she would remember the name of some society man and put all of the shoes on his bill without him knowing. Uh, she loved diamonds. Her tastes were very, very high class and luxurious, and this drove her to wanting more and more material things. It wasn't long before Doris began a passionate affair with Stephen Sanford, who was an American millionaire and polo player. Stephen Sanford was also known as Laddie Sanford. He collected polo trophies well into the 1960s and 1970s, and he was the heir to the Bigelow Hartford Carpet Mills Company. The Bigelow Hartford Carpet Mills was once one of the largest manufacturers of carpeting in the United States. It was located in Connecticut and started in 1895. Unfortunately, it closed during St Sanford's lifetime in the 1960s. So this is sad, you know, instead of focusing on his own employees and the people that built his great fortune, 
Sanford was content to spend his money on a mistress, Doris Castle Ross. And, you know, it's, it's just like, why would you want to screw over a people, a community that made you your money so that you could bet on polo ponies, so that you could play with polo ponies for, for nothing? Here is a whole community in Thompsonville, Connecticut that could have benefited from Sanford's effort and attention, and instead it's no longer in existence. It went out of business in the 1960s. It could have taken advantage of the manufacturing upticks in the 1980s, but no. So we have this man, Stephen Sanford, paying for Doris's lifestyle. He installed her in a house on Deanery Street and showered her with gifts, uh, including a generous allowance that covered a chauffeured Rolls Royce, a personal maid, and a wardrobe. Doris was in her 20s at the time of her affair with Sanford, and he would pay for her orders of 250 pairs of shoes in one go. However, Sanford moved on. You know, he didn't move on to, to paying attention to industry. He moved on to courting Edwina Mountbatten, the wife of Lord Mountbatten. But Doris kept the house. And so Doris moved on too. She took to frequenting nightclubs in hope of finding rich men who could afford to spend their money on her. This is a different scene than nightclubs today. Um, the nightclubs were frequented by members of the aristocracy, members of the nobility, occasionally members of the royal family would sneak out and have a good time in the nightclubs. So this was not a terrible plan for gaining more money um, from Doris's perspective. She was revered for her good looks, and when she was 28, she met the then 37-year-old Valentine Brown, who was also the Viscount Castle Ross at a St. James nightclub. He was the gossip columnist for the Sunday Express, he was also a close friend of Lord Beaverbrook and the inspiration for Evelyn Waugh's Mr. Chatterbox, uh, covered in his Bright Young Things overview. He was said to have been smitten with Doris from the start to the point of obsession. She continued seeing other men after meeting him, but Valentine wanted Doris to himself. He even stole the key to her house in order to break in, which led to a violent scene between them. In an attempt to compete with her admirers, he began to send her jewels, furs, and paintings, which plunged him into debt. While Valentine was a journalist and he did have some revenue from advertisements for cigarettes and other products he had, he wasn't that wealthy of a man. He had a title, but he couldn't afford to be sending Doris all of these gifts. His friends knew it, and his family knew it, and they warned him against marrying. And Valentine's mother threatened to cut him off. Doris was aware of this, and so when the couple did get married, they did so secretly at Hammersmith Register Office on May 16th, 1928. Valentine's parents found out, cut him off, and Doris felt that she had to go back to her lovers in order to fund her lifestyle. The couple became the talk of Mayfair due to their repeated public scenes and, which would get violent and they would bite and scratch each other. They soon separated and Doris moved out and they spent the next decade mounting divorce cases against one another with Brown claiming infidelity and Doris claiming physical abuse. The pair eventually called it quits in 1938. During the 1930s, Doris turned her hand to journalism, and she became a society spy for the wealthy newspaper magnate Lord Beaverbrook, a friend of her husband's, and she tipped him off on her society friends in exchange for money. So we see the evil and wah, bright young things, Mr. Chatterbox plotline coming through. She entertained affairs with several members of high society, supposedly including an affair with Winston Churchill in France in 1930. 
It has been alleged that this was Winston Churchill's only affair. Uh, maybe, you know, I don't know, but it was an affair that did not end well for Doris. Churchill supposedly cut her off after the four-year affair ended, uh, would not even talk to her when she was in dire straits during World War II. But supposedly, Churchill painted her during a holiday in the south of France and took her to the Ritz in Paris. A lot of the basis for this affair is the reports of Churchill's second secretary who did not know Doris personally. And so he, the secretary, Jock Colville, claimed these things in a 1985 interview about the four-year affair, which supposedly started in 1933. So Churchill biographers say that this is just unlikely and it didn't happen. And on top of that, Valentine Castle Ross was well known as a very brutal gossip column, columnist. And so why would Churchill, this very adept politician, engage in this kind of affair? The divorce filings, in the divorce filings, Churchill isn't mentioned as a potential correspondent, obviously. Uh, who Viscount Castle Ross chose to name was Robert Her Heber Percy, who was a well-known homosexual whom uh, Doris was supposedly alleging to cure. I think that this al allegations where she tried to cure gays is overblown. I don't think she did. I think that she wanted money from men and women, and that's what she went for regardless of their sexuality, their marital status. So, um, supposedly she then had an affair with Churchill's son, Randolph Churchill, in, in reminiscences of Randolph Churchill. He was definitely a party boy. He drank a lot, and so they certainly did party together. She was friends with Mr. Noel Coward, and they would travel from the United States to Britain together. My opinion of Mr. Coward is very poor. I think he encouraged his friends to engage in really risky behavior. And you can view, um, you can listen to some more details about him in the videos on my channel. Um, she, she also engaged in a somewhat affair friendship with Cecil Beaton. Uh, Beaton was a homosexual, but supposedly, you know, she really cared for him and they really cared for each other. She then moved on to a man named the, that was named as correspondent in her divorce proceedings, Robert Herbert Percy, and he was known as Mad Boy. Supposedly she booked a room at the Ritz for his birthday and presented him with a prostitute and a whip and ordered him to beat the woman to death. When he failed to do so, it's not that he refused, he just failed to do so. She reportedly took the whip herself saying, I haven't wasted my money for this, I will do it. In the mid-1930s, she met New York socialite Margot Hoffman and supposedly had an affair with her. Margot bought the Palazzo Venere di Leone in Venice for Doris for parties. But when the Second World War broke out and there was oversight on foreign ownership by, of Italian land by Mussolini, the relationship did not last. The Palazzo Venere di Leone in Venice is owned by the Guggenheim family today. This was difficult for Doris. She found herself falling on hard times. She was so social in British society, she had actually made enemies and she had socialized with the Mosleys, part of the British nationalist movement, and this caused a lot of ostracizing in British society during World War II. People felt that they couldn't trust her, and so she started pawning off her furs, her diamonds, her jewelries, and she just was not able to survive. It was, it was a difficult time for her. She called on her ex-husband, Viscount Castle Ross, to 
help her and he offered to remarry her but he was seeing another woman at the time Enid Viscountess Furness. Doris returned to England from New York hoping to see her ex-husband and they met but Castle Ross found her appearance quote haggard and went back to Enid. Realizing he would not marry her, Doris took to selling more of her diamonds to a broker in New York. However, selling diamonds during World War II was a crime, and her telegrams to New York about the diamonds were intercepted, leading to a police interrogation. Doris didn't know about this law. Um, she was destitute, and she was trying to survive. She was wary of jail time, she had been drinking, and she was staying at the Rochester Hotel in London. And that is where she succumbed to an overdose of sleeping pills in 1942, aged 42. She was childless. Her sister, the grandmother of Cara Delevingne and Poppy Delevingne, lived to be over 100 years old. So it's sad to see that one sister had such a hard time of it and lived a very hard lifestyle, a hard drinking, hard partying lifestyle, and it ended in her ruin. However, people have not forgotten Doris Castle Ross. And in a recent auction, a painting of her was uh, fetched over 400,000 pounds. So this is a woman who continues to inspire, who continues to baffle readers today.